Good evening, everybody. Uh, on behalf of Nova Bay, I'd like to uh, thank you for coming to the uh, webinar this evening. We have a very distinguished speaker, and I would like to uh, introduce him. I'm sure many of you know, already know him, uh, John Shepard. Uh, John is the president and managing partner of Virginia Eye Consultants, founder of the ProVisionNetwork.com. He's the COO of translational pharmaceutical company IRX Research, ophthalmology residency research director, clinical director at the Thomas R. Lee Ocular Pharmacology Laboratory, and professor of ophthalmology, microbiology, and molecular biology at Eastern Virginia Medical School. He is medical director of the Lions Eye Bank of Eastern Virginia and serves clinical ophthalmology and eye and contact lenses editor and chief medical editor of Medscape Ophthalmology. He received the AAO Senior Honor Award and has been one of the best doctors in America. He has been the principal investigator in over 120 clinical trials, including 35 dry eye protocols. He has pre presented 700 invited lectures and visiting professorships worldwide and serves on the advisory board of 65 pharmaceutical and medical device companies. Uh, without uh, further ado, let me introduce uh, John Shepard to you. And John, thank you for uh, joining us tonight. Truly a pleasure, Glenn. Thank you so much. I trust everybody is uh, safely at home and well fed. I want to share with you tonight some really exciting personal experiences I've had with my job as a cornea external disease, anterior segment surgeon, and uveitis specialist. We're always looking for new solutions, better ways to handle things, and sometimes back to the future makes a lot of sense. Simplicity and straightforwardness and even a link to homeopathy and mother nature. And we all know that the lid is a key part of the ocular protective mechanism and in fact of the seven part ocular surface. Ocular surface was first conceptualized by my late mentor Richard Thoft and he described this seven-part system as the corneal epithelium, the conjunctival epithelium, the lids themselves, the secretory apparatus, the nasal lacrimal drainage system, and the fifth and seventh cranial nerves. And we know that the lids are intrinsic to this interdependent unit which is as strong as only its weakest link. And we know that there are several important components to the lid. And we also remember that the conjunctival surface lines the tarsus. The tarsus provides us tremendous insight into the status of the ocular surface. And yet we forget to flip that upper lid so many times. The conjunctival surface is 17 times more extensive than the surface area of the cornea itself. And now we can image this. We have DMI in our clinics. Several companies, including Tier Science, make dynamic myboomian imaging possible on a case-by-case, rapid-fire basis. Virtually all of our technicians are trained. And here you see a patient with a normal array of myboomian glands in the lower lid. About 95% are intact. And this patient has more advanced myboomian gland disease with some truncation, some missing glands, atrophic glands, and irregularly anatomically aligned glands. And we can see that the tarsus does not contain all gland, but there is some atrophic and fibrotic areas. And this last patient is quite alarmed, highly motivated to self-treat and to undergo perhaps more aggressive therapies like neurostimulation, some type of thermal pulsation therapy, uh, the mask and probe, Blefex, Myboflow, any of these wonderful new innovations in ocular surface and lid therapy. And by this new imaging, we understand better the chronic damage that can occur to the lid because chronic lid disease produces microbial bioburdens, inflammatory toxins, and uh, bioactive substances such as cytokines, MMP9, and collagenases, and immunoglobulins, as well as excess lipase and saponification of the otherwise beneficial phospholipids on this ocular surface, and formation of a biofilm in the living being let alone on the surface of a contact lens case. 
So pure hypochlorous acid is found in the body in the phagocytic vesicles of the PMN, the neutrophil, the white blood cell, which ingest and destroy bacteria with this pure substance in nanomolar quantities. It's an essential component of the nonspecific immune response in the body. The HOCL kills bugs, neutralizes toxins and pathogens, suppresses the body's inflammatory response, believe it or not, and prevents biofilm formation. And Neutrox is a proprietary pure form of hypochlorous acid, and it's self-preserved. Not many of those out there, only Vigamox that I can think of at this time is commercially available. And so it is not manufactured with any impurities. It reduces the overall bacteria population, inactivates inflammatory bacterial and host toxins, and degrades, eliminates bacterial enzymes, including lipase. And it prevents the biofilm formation. As we see here, the Neutrox process is chemical, produces 100% pure HOCl, whereas other types of HOCl production are done with Dakin's electrolysis, and this produces other contaminants, including sodium hypochlorite. So other types of hypochlorous acid products contain impurities, that is, some preservative materials as well as the hypochlorite, which itself is toxic and lyses epithelial cells. And in other products, this particular agent is deleterious to the ocular surface. It's kind of like using a preservative. It's kind of like impure substances that we see unpredictably in generic medications. So this pure formulation is essential to pure elimination of toxins, lipase, bacteria. And we see that the human cell produces this extracellular matrix that naturally produces pro-inflammatory cytokines that are somewhat collaborative interestingly enough, with the bacterial toxins, both of which produce damage to ocular structures, cicatrization of the substantia propria and the conjunctiva, scarring, thinning, ectasia, haze, and the cornea, and a wide variety of other conditions that eliminate functional follicular cells for lashes and functional meibomian glands in the posterior lamellar tarsal plate. So this process can be neutralized by neutrox or hypochlorous acid in its pure state without any toxic effects. And by neutralizing pathogens, toxins, and host effectors, we produce a natural form of anti-inflammatory activity without drugs. And we also have specific antimicrobial activity against an incredibly broad spectrum of Staph aureus, Epidermidus, Hemolyticus, uh, Strep mitis, Clostridium, P. acnes, other anaerobes, and other types of gram-negative seen most commonly in contact lens infections like the infamous Proteus pseudomonas and serratia that we all fear. In addition, this is effective against fungi, candida, and aspergillus. And these are commonly found flora and commonly found pathogens on the ocular surface tissues, which in higher titers and with disruption of protective epithelial membranes produces infective lesions, chalasia, squamous blepharitis, keratitis, and even endophthalmitis. So in an ARVO presentation for 2016, a foresight study looked at the effect on bacterial flora after 20 minutes of a single application of Avanova by standard lid scrub technique. There were 36 subjects, 72 specimens, 22 ladies, 14 gentlemen, with the average age of 19 to 88. And these subjects all had some lid inflammation, and they would certainly benefit from lid hygiene. And what was seen? a more than two log order decrease in the number of bacteria on the surface. This bioload was reduced 99 plus percent for staphylococci and staph epidermis specifically. This is truly remarkable. This is an instantaneous repeatable effect. And yet the microbial diversity did not change. The bioload decreased, the flora decreased in numbers, and we all know that infection is truly directly related to the titer. In fact, when we perform cataract surgery, PCR analyses and even cultural analyses show that there's bacteria or bacterial DNA in the anterior chamber of 20 to 30 percent of people who undergo routine, supposedly sterile cataract surgery. And we know from Mark Speaker's DNA studies through PCR analysis that the bacteria that cause endophthalmitis are exactly those found in the flora, not from the instruments, not from the air, but from the patient's own flora. And clearly, a vigorous irrigation aspiration washing of all debris 
an exchange of the aqueous volume twofold and removal of all residual lens material that may act as some form of adjuvant with interocular inflammation takes about one and a half to two minutes. And I will perform that process with all of my cataract surgeries. It seems laborious, you're done with a case, but you gotta get all the viscoelastic and debris and aqueous exchange out of the eye and therefore vigorously removing bacteria. Even a small titer, 10 to the second, 10 to the third, when left unchecked, will create endophthalmitis. So lowering the surface tida with an excellent prep with betadine, and in all of my surgery patients, 100%, a vigorous Evanova prep at least two weeks, if not more, prior to surgery is essential. And every single patient at their surgery scheduling visit starts Evanova therapy with hypochlorous acid in my practice. None should go unchecked. That is a breach of our protocol if patients are not recommended preoperative floral reduction, it's not sterilization, it's tighter reduction on the ocular surface. So the diversity was not changed. Staph isolates were 60% of the total isolates recovered. Epidermidis was 36% of the total isolates and propionobacterium magnes was 22% of these isolates. The staphylococci were reduced 99.6% and the susceptibility profile revealed that the hypochlorous acid treatment reduced the bioload of resistant isolates equally as well as those of susceptible isolates. So that's beautiful news to me. The in vitro comparisons with betadine are remarkable. It's a comparable spectrum, but there's some agents like serratium marcescens, for instance, that are not covered adequately by betadine. The onset of activity is twice as fast, one versus two minutes with the Evanova. And the Evanova remains active with a toxicity level a thousand fold less than betadine. So the patient with ulcerative blepharitis clearly has remarkably higher titers than a patient who's asymptomatic without lid lesions. And we know that the lid, the skin, the lash follicles, the meibomian orifices, and the cul-de-sac, and even the canaliculus can act as reservoirs for bacteria. So every log order of reduction is key to reducing the risk of a spontaneous infection with disruption of cutaneous or mucosal surface membranes and the introduction of organisms into an eye for cataract surgery, into an interface with DSEC surgery or LASIK surgery, and certainly into the skin with any type of lid surgery, let alone the subconscientible space with glaucoma surgery. So we save antibiotics for serious infections. We prefer to use this antiseptic agent, if you will, with a comparable spectrum to betadine that does not produce bacterial resistance for our routine prophylactic use. And this is truly a versatile approach. As we know, resistance is becoming a major issue with all of medicine, with the pharmaceutical industry, and with the lay press as well. And as a result, I am very concerned about producing resistant organisms, as I am concerned about producing inflammatory activity on the surface of the eye. And if we look at a lipase assay comparing Avanova to a wide variety of other commonly used agents on the ocular surface, we see that the activity of bacterial lipase in the presence of various hygiene products can be measured over time in relative fluorescence units. And only the Avanova produces no lipase activity. Water, Theratiers, Ocusoft, Ocusoft Plus, Baby Shampoo, and Cleardex all allow lipase activity to remain intact and increase after the initial application. There's a long-lasting anti-lipase activity from the Avanova. So this biofilm barrier occurs throughout nature. It occurs in the gut, occurs in the skin, it can occur on the ocular surface, certainly in uh, excoriated and keratinized lid margins, and in patients, of course, undergoing cataract surgery and those who use contact lenses who have biofilms on their lenses and their lens cases. Thus, I always encourage patients to use daily wear disposable lenses. They cost a little bit more, but the cost is less in terms of the maintenance of fluids for nightly storage. So I'm not happy about biofilm barriers. I'm not happy about patients who have organisms growing in the biofilm to the point that the Charles Campbell Laboratory at the University of Pittsburgh, my residency alma mater, the study comparing Avanova to PBS and azithromycin 1% showed that it was truly possible to eliminate biofilms, but virtually impossible with agents that did not include hypochlorous acid. 
Looking, for instance, at staph epidermidis, we see that at five minutes, 30% were gone, and at 30 minutes, 99%, 0.9% were gone. And if you look at F staph aureus in, in the biofilm, we see that, again, 99.99% .99 are gone at 30 minutes. And there is no reduction in colony-forming units with exposure to PBS to the tune of a, a 0.01 p-value with Avanova. You can also look at the biofilm on the surface of contact lenses, lens cases, lids, even intraocular lenses prior to insertion or after removal. And the PBS produces virtually no effect of staph aureus on a biofilm, whereas it kills virtually all of the staph aureus in a biofilm, looking at the propidium iodide assay in the ocular surface and the surface of biomaterials. Staph aureus killing is possible in the biofilm by azithromycin, but at 30 minutes, about 65% are dead. This is not a log order reduction. In fact, again, a p-value of 0.01 with Avanova compared to azithromycin. So azithromycin is a great substance to use. It's an antibiotic with a broad spectrum. There's a lot of resistance these days. It's available as azocyte in the outstanding sustained release delivery system of duracyte. And with this particular agent, we've been encouraged to use once a day therapy for not only anti-inflammatory, uh, but also antimicrobial effect, and use this particular substance as a rub on or a, a drop in for patients with blepharitis. Sometimes I use it as a maintenance medicine for contact lens use, at least in the past. It's a great agent, good for conjunctivitis, but it clearly has its drawbacks. In fact, patients who use azithromycin can develop resistance. We are looking also at the anti-inflammatory effect of oral doxycycline, which has wonderful effect on a wide variety of collagenases and certainly on MMP9. And the tetracycline class drug is, is very commonly used in eye care, ophthalmology and optometry, to inhibit inflammation, particularly in patients with rosacea and chronic lid disease. And yet, there are significant systemic toxicities to doxycycline, such as sunburn, GI issues, and even a, an obscure report out of England of uh, potentiation of breast cancer. So a company called Hovione is developing topical minocycline. This should be a, an outstanding agent for just that use, long-term anti-inflammatory therapy. <clears throat> and yet, it's still subject to the vagaries of resistance development, as you would see with all types of antimicrobial agents. In fact, in patients who have repeated intraocular injections, with or without a biofilm, with or without contact lenses, but certainly with posterior segment and macular disease, the practice of giving repeated antimicrobial, that is antibiotic topical therapy, has been actually shown to be non-beneficial, deleterious. If, in fact, you give a patient who's going to be undergoing intravitreal injections, and those are almost certainly to be repeated, each consecutive course of a topical antibiotic produces more resistance. So if you give patients Cipro or Levo or Moxidrops for a course of three to five days pre or post an intravitreal injection, they will invariably develop fluoroquinolone resistance. And they'll respond to aminoglycosides or sulfonamides. If you give an aminoglycoside over and over again, they develop aminoglycoside resistance and so on. So it's actually exactly the wrong thing to do to give intravitreal injection patients an antimicrobial agent over and over again. So the PrEP is done with betadine. All these patients, in my mind, should be prepped for several days preoperatively and certainly on the day of intravitreal injection with hypochlorous acid. And we look again at the biofilm issue coag negative Staphylococcus aureus in the biofilm, four log order loss of colony form units in just five minutes of exposure. Again, statistically significant compared to PBS. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is remarkable. At five minutes, 99.99% of Pseudomonas is wiped out. So there's a, a tremendous ability of hypochlorous to kill Pseudomonas. Certainly a Pseudomonas endophthalmitis can be devastating relatively rare for both intravitreal and post-cataract surgeries, uh, but nevertheless in the poorest prognostic group because of the uh, tremendous number of endotoxins produced 
by these gram-negative organisms as well as some secretory collagenase activity that is second to none in, in the microbial world that can instantly destroy ocular tissues. So in a condition where there is chronic application of potential contaminants, where implants are to be used, where injections are given repeatedly, where perhaps contact lens maintenance is required for long-term care of, of a compromised ocular surface, the Viafilm study tells us a lot. Staph strains in contact lens cases are susceptible. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is particularly susceptible in a contact lens case. Biofilm staph strains are susceptible to Avanova, but not PBS, and certainly not to azithromycin. So we clearly have a strategy that makes sense with this, if you will, antiseptic agent. Now we all know that cataract surgery negatively impacts dry eye. In fact, if you perform cataract surgery, you will reduce the patient's ocular surface one dues unit from a one to two or two to three. And if you perform LASIK surgery, you worsen their dry eye and reduce their dues level by two severity steps. So you must plan pre-op and post-op. And remarkably, you don't want to tell a patient that they've developed dry eye after their cataract surgery, after their LASIK surgery, if you haven't told them ahead of time, or it's your fault, it's the fault of your surgery. So always be prepared, and a great way to prepare a patient for any type of surgery, both from an antimicrobial floral log order reduction point of view, as well as an anti-inflammatory point of view, is with Avanova. And in this era of tremendous expectations and endless demands from patients who, in particular, receive a premium IOL, we have to be on our game all the time. We cannot have ocular surface irregularity from dry eye. We cannot risk any form of infection. In fact, premium IOLs are the savior of ophthalmology. Every year we have one, two, three, ten percent reductions in targeted codes. One year glaucoma, another year retina, another year cataract surgery, last year YAG capsulotomy. Our rates are going to stagnate or decrease from CMS. No doubt about it, and that will continue for the rest of our careers. Cash-based procedures make our patients see better, have more convenient vision, and produce reliable, outstanding ethical income streams for our practices. Premium lenses, premium procedures, Botox, lid procedures, refractive surgery, thermal pulsation therapy, uh, lid hygiene, dry eye centers of excellence are all cash-based procedures that will grow our practices and allow us to remain financially viable and continue to enjoy our work and take care of the truly sick and needy patients among us. So there's two primary forms of dry eye, and we know that evaporative dry eye is by far the most common. Mike Lem's paper showed in 2012 that 86 percent of patients have MGD as an important or primary component in the dry eye, where aqueous deficiency is only found in 14 percent of patients. So I see three types of dry eye patients in my clinic. One, a new patient consult. They've seen a lot of doctors. They're mad. They don't want to see any more. They don't want any more treatment. They require the scientific introduction of one or two new treatments with each visit to best analyze that particular intervention. Maybe a short-acting therapy like a punctal plug and a longer-acting therapy like a nutritional. But everybody gets ocular surface scrubs. It makes no sense to allow high titers of bacteria, lipase activity, and inflammation in the eye that can be controlled with a relatively inexpensive yet prescription natural substance available through Avanova and hypochlorous acid pure therapy. The second type of patient is an existing dry eye patient who really has another primary diagnosis. That may be glaucoma, transplant pterygium, macular disease, diabetic disease, ocular surface conditions caused by injuries or neurotrophic disease. And you're working on something else, but you've got to take care of the dry eye. So you want to use preventative therapy and targeted diagnostics. I use my osmolarity, MMP9 testing, dynamic meibomian imaging, and allergy studies to best hit the most important component of this patient's dry eye as early on in the treatment course as possible, and eliminate issues that may be worse than in their dry eye, like non-proprietary generic and over-the-counter drugs. These drugs have impurities, higher concentrations 
of preservatives, and certainly regardless of the merit of the medication, produce chronic irritation when used repeatedly. So we use preservative-free preparations. We use SLT or surgical mix therapy to reduce the need for glaucoma medicines. It's very important to address the entire patient and all of the eye diseases simultaneously. Finally, the most important, I believe, patient who has a dry eye is the cataract surgery candidate. They want rapid restoration of stable biometry and they need immediate, basic, and advanced therapy. So they'll get scrubs, they'll get omega-3s, they'll get plugs, they get steroids, they get zydra or Ristasis, they get thermal pulsation therapy, they get it all now. I don't care which one's working, I just want them all to work. I want them to get better as quickly as possible so I can perform an excellent biometry and a very safe surgery. So prior to surgery, we have zero tolerance for cell flare macular edema, hyperosmolarity, positive MMP9 keratic precipitates, punctate keratopathy, particularly on the visual axis, and therefore topographic irregularity. And now hypochlorous acid forms a central part of that strategy for me. And I do find it most convenient to look at the central four or five meibomian orifices in the middle of the lower lid. And this provides a way to follow the same anatomical structures throughout the course of therapy, looking at the consistency, the expressibility, and the color of the meibomian secretions repeatedly. And serially. And I use a Q-tip. Dick Thoff taught me to do that. I push on the lids of every patient I see. I don't stick my fingernail and finger in there, and I don't have to wear gloves, and I don't contaminate patients. It's a very convenient way to look at the lids. You can also use the, co the Corb lid depressor, an ingenious spring-loaded device to apply a uniform amount of, of pressure onto the eyelids to, chest, to check the expressibility of the meibomian secretions. And our purpose, of course, is to provide appropriate therapy, and certainly for advanced or moderate meibomian gland disease, thermal pulsation makes a lot of sense. It's become a part of our preoperative regimen and is always accompanied by nutritionals, hypochlorous acid, and anti-inflammatories. It just works better. So this is a patient who was undergoing a combined procedure for cataract surgery and DSEC for advanced Fuchs dystrophy. And it was a very difficult ocular surface to control because of the dry eye disease. Uh, they responded fairly well to zydrotherapy. There was just too much lid going on. So they had anterior and posterior blepharitis. And I think these spiked keratinized meibomian orifices can provide a foreign body sensation all by themselves. You may have no punctate keratopathy. You may have a benign tarsus. When you flip the lid, there may be no cysts or concretions there but you can't get rid of the foreign body sensation unless you put in a bandage contact lens. If it's these orifices, they need regular hygiene and they need to be removed with avenue therapy. And you can see how the anterior and the posterior lamella of this patient awaiting surgery was markedly improved with avenue therapy where standard therapy previously had not worked. Another case, Maxitrol didn't work. The aminoglycosides, including the Asporin, produce hypersensitivity reactions, you stop that and you move forward with scrub therapy. And again, the anterior lamella looks much better and the posterior lamella is preserved, but you can see that the lash truncation and loss has uh, truly marked this patient's uh, misery in terms of comfort and appearance as well. So there's a vast array of, of uses for hypochlorous acid in my practice. Blepharitis, of course, is central. It's an essential component of the basic dry eye foundation therapy along with omega-3s. Everybody gets it. In fact, you have to ask, who should not get hypochlorous acid? Who should not get omega-3 and essential fatty acid therapy? That's a much smaller group. Surgical prophylaxis, intraocular, extraocular, surface, lid, oculoplastics, and intravitreal injections all deserve log order tighter decreases in their flora some of which in virtually all of our patients is antibiotic resistant. And these very difficult patients that produce a conundrum were taught to use only short-term antibiotic therapy in adequate doses. The best way to produce resistance is chronic therapy, inadequate therapy, uh, less than prescribed therapy once or twice a day instead of three or four times a day, producing lots of trough levels between doses and dabbling with antibiotics on a PRN basis. That's the best way to produce resistance. And yet, when a patient has a Procara lens or a chronic bandage therapeutic lens for severe neurotrophic disease or chronic erosions, 
you have to decide whether or not you're going to put them on an antibiotic. Do you use moxifloxacin because it's preservative-free, BID or TID for months at a time? Do you rotate with polytram? Do you rotate with aminoglycoside? What is the right thing to do? Well, the right thing to do is to do a culture, look for resistant organisms, target them with the right antibiotic with appropriate pulse therapy, 7 to 10 days, and then maintain them afterwards with continuous Avanova therapy. Reduce those titers, reduce the inflammation. Particularly relevant to patients with neurotrophic and erosion disease who regularly produce epithelial defects and K-PRO patients. The recommendations have been to use vancomycin or fortified vancomycin once a day ad infinitum. Scary process, but clearly benefits these patients with improved results and a reduced prevalence of endothelitis. And as we all know, with a K-PRO, one episode of endothelitis is truly the end of that eye. So doctors are turning now to more novel maintenance antimicrobial therapies coupled with bacterial load reduction using Avanova therapy. So this, this is a very exciting time in eye care. We have an ideal chronic lid and lash hygiene therapy that is anti-inflammatory. It inactivates lipase, it blocks cytokines, it blocks bacterial inflammatory toxins, and has an anti-biofilm activity and reduces bacteria. This is an essential addition to any lid and lash regimen for hygiene. It's good for MGD, dry eye, blepharitis, sty, Chalazian prevention, Demodex, follicularum, and it's outstanding for patients who wear contact lenses. In fact, you can clean the case if you insist on using reusable contact lenses with a hypochlorous acid. And it's really an essential component in my mind for pre and post surgical lid and lash hygiene and prophylaxis. So the current paradigm for treating chronic lid disease is lid scrubs, hot compresses. Nobody uses hot compresses. Everybody hates compresses. You don't leave it on long enough to increase the temperature. The only way to truly get the temperature up is to use thermal pulsation therapy with heaters on both sides of both lids. So this is a level one chronic regimen. It can be used as an acute therapy too, but when I see a Chalazian that's acute, I like to drain it, it's an abscess, and these patients many times use systemic antibiotics, such as Bactrim, which provides excellent MRSA and MRST coverage. So the, the chronic regimen now, as well as the acute regimen, becomes Avanova and omega-3 supplements. It's more natural, it's homeopathic, patients like this, it's, it doesn't require an antibiotic, and it can also substitute for acute treatment as well. So once we get past level one, the paradigm continues for chronic lid disease. We, we maintain omega-3s, or a mixture of omega-3s with gamma linoleic acid that we see in hydro eye. And we use the pure hypochlorous with the omega-3 supplement, and we move to heat and mechanical or manual expression with the devices we all know and love in our offices, which are a part of our dry eye center of excellence and a part fairly instantaneous relief to the vast majority of patients we select for therapy. And we use this as a micro sponge along the lids and lashes to remove excessive debris and unblock meibomi glands on a chronic basis. And then we finally move to pharmaceutical intervention. And yes, I still like using doxycycline and tetracycline, but we use it a lot less now with the advent of Avanova. And I will use those oral agents even less when topical minocycline becomes available two to three years down the road. So Avanova has a unique MOA. Nothing else produces this exact mechanism. It works concomitantly as an adjuvant with any lid and lash hygiene regimen. It works with steroids and antibiotics. It's safe to use chronically after acute regimens. Imagine a child with chronic staphylococcal hypersensitivity, keratitis, and neovascularization. These are the last people you want to put on steroid therapy because they're five times more likely to develop a pressure rise. Ideal for these kids who have ocular surface hypersensitivity disease. Avanova avoids the chronic ocular side effects associated with steroids and antibiotics. Zydra and Restasis work well with the fast exit, uh, onset of action of Avanova. This is a complementary mechanism of action, and I think that the Zydra and Restasis both kick in quicker, respectively, when the patient is also on hygiene therapy. Again, an essential initial component of ocular surface treatment. 
and it manages the lid disease variables like bugs, debris, itchy, scratchy eyelids that Zydra and Restasis do not treat, at least not early on. And it's just part of that essential package. It works with tea tree oil. It's more comfortable than tea tree oil. It manages the variables of Demodex infestation as tea tree oil does, plus its multitude additional effects. So, Cleardex is a good drug. You can use it as you wish, but you know, chronic use of Cleardex is not pleasant. And I find that you know, a quick pulse therapy and resistant cases who do not respond to other treatments with Cleardex is fine, but the patients get off of that much faster and go on immediate Avanova maintenance therapy ad infinitum so they don't have to go back on the more toxic, odiferous, if you will, tea tree oil therapy. We use mechanical lid expression, a mandatory component. We, in fact, have something we call the iFit kit. All of our surgery patients get it. All of our thermal pulsation therapy patients get it. It's got a warm compress. It's got a little bit of Lodomax in it, and it has the Avanova, and it has HydroI, which we use. Uh, PRN is an outstanding formulation as well. And we use this as a concomitant to other lid manipulative procedures. So we did a trial several years ago showing that HydroI is truly superior to any type of placebo. It actually reduces the inflammation through several T cell biomarkers, and it improves the OSDI in patients who have chronic mobomian based dry eye. Similarly, a multi center trial showed that uh, proactive therapy with the PRN oral reesterified omega 3s, now available from Tier Lab rather than Alpheon, allows patients to achieve control of ocular surface disease, both lid and corneal punctate based, as you would desire with a good omega 3 supplement. The reesterified omega 3s are more bioavailable. The GLA in Hydro Eye produces a common and complementary anti-inflammatory effect. So if the eyelids show anterior blepharitis, if they show lash loss, if they show notching, they show posterior blepharitis, inspissated mebomian glands, early chalasia, uh, late chalasia, early hordeolums, lid scarring, you know that they will benefit from Evanova therapy. It can improve within weeks or even days. It doesn't burn or sting. There's no age restrictions. It works great in kids. There's no time restrictions. It's non-cytotoxic. There's no microbial resistance, and there are no other significant side effects. Hypersensitivity to the ingredient is rare. I've, in fact, never seen one. So what's, what's the new necessary? Dental hygiene, brush, floss, and then Avanova. Make this part of your daily routine. It takes about 20 seconds to do the Avanova right. It doesn't kill your daily regimen. It can be done can come to other personal hygiene or recreational activities. It's just not hard to remember. It's easy to do. You can close your eyes when you rub, a couple of sprays, wipe it away, and then repeat. If you wipe the base of the lid, some people are really good at everting that lower lid, make sure that they can see what they're doing, and you repeat. This is a fantastic new treatment. It's so simple and so elegant and yet so effective and so without side effects and completely without the advent of microbial resistance. It's the only pure hypochlorous acid lid and lash hygiene product. It doesn't contain contaminants that produce a toxic effect. It's the ideal alone or concomitant product for any daily lid and lash regimen. It has no time of use. It can be used indefinitely. Many of my patients swear by this stuff and they go very, very ballistic when they run out. And there's no age restrictions. It's ideal for itchy, scratchy, swollen lids caused by blepharitis and MGD and dry eye. And it can be used as part of the lid and lash hygiene regimen for all ocular surgical procedures, all of them. Refractive, cataract, glaucoma, vitriol, corneal, surface, all procedures. And it's good for makeup removal to normalize flora. Imagine the contaminants in routine makeup. And it can be used before and after contact lens wear. This is tr truly an innovative and yet remarkably elegantly simple therapy. It's not talk, it's, it's relatively inexpensive, it's well tolerated, it's great for kids and really old people. You don't need that much agility to do it. It's easier to do than putting a drop in the eye. And I am happy to entertain any questions. I thank you for your attendance. I hope you will view this 
particular intervention now as enthusiastically as I do and I have in my practice. John, Glenn, thanks thank for inviting you. me to speak. John, thank you very much. That was a really wonderful talk. I'm going to open it up for questions now. Now, if you look in your, uh, your dialog box for the webinar, you'll see a questions box in gray. If you have any questions, would you please type those in? Uh, okay, we have one, uh, one, uh, one question. First one is, will this product be available in Canada? Uh, the, uh, the, the short answer is not in the near term. We don't have any plans to bring this product to Canada at this point. Great business opportunity for somebody. It is. It is. We're, we're working on it. Uh, we have another question. Another question, John. Um, a doctor says that, you know, usually use Restasis and Zydra. Are you recommending to start with Avanova or just add Avanova to the Restasis or Zydra prescription? And that's a good question. And I, I really break that down into the type of patient that I'm seeing. If it's the particular uh, excessively symptomatic or clearly uh, damaged chronic dry eye patient who's just there for dry eye and has had a complex you know, polypharmacy and confusing array of prescriptions, medications, plugs, and all of the above from several different often conflicting providers, I try to introduce one thing at a time. I think in a patient who's taking medications, as in a chronic glaucoma patient, it might be a better first choice than even more drops, although I think both Restasis and Zydra work very well in the context of a motivated compliant glaucoma patient. In terms of the cataract patient, it's you know, launch all missiles immediately. It's a nuclear attack on the ocular surface, and I'll start the Zydra or Restasis. I'll start the steroids as well. Start the, the oral nutritionals, do the lid scrubs, do the dynamic myobomian imaging, and, and, and then the thermal pulsation therapy. Get them on Avanova. Do it all. Let's normalize that ocular surface as quickly as humanly possible. So it really depends on the interface between the provider and the patient. And fortunately, uh, ophthalmology and optometry are unique enough that there's a, a lot of interaction with patient demographic, avocation, personality, family situation, agility, tremor, arthritis, and understanding proprioception, depth perception. There's so many things that, that we now, as experts, subconsciously incorporate in, in, into this matrix of treatment selection, not to mention the, the wonderful new diagnostic tools we have available to guide our decisions. So hopefully uh, our specialties will be the last to be obviated by a artificial intelligence program or a uh, markedly uh, less expensive provider in another country who also speaks English. And it, it's through that, that first-hand interaction that we understand what the patient's needs are, what their frustrations are. There's not a whole lot of people who are happy with repeated warm compress applications, and I find this therapy to be equally effective and, and much simpler. So get on with it, launch it, use it frequently in your practice, use it with the omega-3 therapies as your essential basic treatment, and choose prescription agents and interventional therapy specific to the needs of that patient. And not forgetting allergy, the forgotten third arm of ocular surface disease, which may be the most common ocular surface disease, and yet all the more reason to use pure hypochlorous acid. Very good. Uh, we have another question, John. Uh, is there any indication that Avanova is effective against viral conjunctivitis? Uh, there's some early data. There's some viruses that have recently been discovered through uh, very complex uh, analysis of various uh, genomic sequences on the ocular surface, uh, some viruses we didn't even know existed. And there does seem to be some antiviral effect. I think studies are uh, lacking in terms of HSV, for instance. Uh, certainly it would be a, a, a logical uh, therapy to use for a patient with adenovirus disease because of the, the, the horrible liberation of inflammatory substances and the, and the, the mucoidal miserable discharge of these patients. Uh, suffer, and our desire to intervene w w without doing any harm. 
So uh, certainly it's not going to produce any deleterious effects in a patient with viral disease, but we don't have a whole lot of data that I know of that shows a direct antiviral effect. Obviously, uh, eliminating inflammation, uh, eliminating uh, bacteria is going to benefit the virally infected patient as well. Very good. And we have another question. What is the role of Claridex when Avanova is available? That's a good question, and it's nice to have multiple therapies uh, for a single disease. Uh, we know that the, the active substance in Claridex is clearly toxic to the Demodex organism, and I don't have any studies, to my knowledge, published that show rapidity of elimination of Demodex with tea tree oil compared to hypochlorous acid. Uh, we would have to leave that to someone who is interested in this subject to produce, say, a randomized uh, dual treatment arm study of just that endpoint. And, you know, how do you deter determine an endpoint with Demodex infection? I mean, do you just pluck 10 random lashes? Do you count the, you know, the, the sleeves? Do you do a PCR assay? It's hard enough to do a blepharitis study and evaluate ocular redness or lid marginal telangiectasia. That's why it's been impossible to specifically approve a drug to date for blepharitis. Uh, we're, we're another step more difficult to determine whether or not you have something that's more or less effective against Demodex. And how much of blepharitis is Demodex? Maybe everybody's got a little bit of blepharitis because everybody's got a little bit of Demodex. And it's just that overgrowth in genetically susceptible or less hygienic genetically gifted patients allows them to clearly manifest the specific signs of dem demodex infestation. I think both agents work. Uh, in my mind, it, it might be wise to use one of the others induction therapy and then maintain on the Avanova. Very good. And here's another interesting question. Is there a replacement agent for betadine? Okay, and or are these two agents uh, complementary to each other? That's a great question, and the data screams replacement. I think it's going to be awfully hard to get physicians to replace betadine. It's relatively non-toxic. It's a well-established uh, level one or two intervention for the reduction of microbes and the prevention of disease. It's used in virtually every surgical specialty, and it's clearly the standard of care. In fact, in an endophthalmitis case, there's a much better argument for not using topical antibiotics than there is for not using betadine. And if a doctor hasn't used topical antibiotics, intracamel antibiotics, or betadine, and the patient develops endophthalmitis, I think that patient's lawyer has a very good case whereas it's expected that all of us use betadine for surgery. And several authors have shown that repeated applications of betadine in the OR more thoroughly reduce the bacterial count. And this may be a washing effect, it may be the antiseptic effect, it may be both. But I believe, and I think from looking at eyes that we see in both therapeutic scenarios, uh, the Avanova is less toxic. And I would submit that using the two, most likely sequentially, may be not only synergistic but less toxic than using repeated applications of betadine, and that the serial use of both may be superior in terms of reducing bacterial flora and maybe, heaven forbid, a 50,000 patient study in reducing endophthalmitis. We do know that there's a revolution in endophthalmitis pre prevention now. And it started in Europe with the uh, CRS study. There's been literally scores of studies worldwide looking at vancomycin, looking at cefuroxime, looking at septazidine, and looking at moxifloxacin in the prevention of endophthalmitis intracamerally. And lo and behold, that may become the new standard. Uh, we are seeing more and more American surgeons now, after the Shorstein study at Kaiser Permanente in Northern California, telling us that maybe we should all be using intracameral antibiotics, the most popular of which, which now appears to be moxifloxacin. Remembering that they're in the eye, 
to kill the bugs that are introduced from the ocular surface during cataract surgery. So in my eye, I'm happy to have everything. I'll take some intracameral antibiotic, I'll take some avanova, and I'll take some betadine. Nothing like tri-mechanism synergy to prevent the most devastating disease in all of ocular surgery. Very good. Well, I think that wraps up all of the questions. Uh, again, I want to thank John Shepard for spending time with us this evening. Uh, excellent presentation. And I'd like to thank all of the listeners who, uh, who tuned in tonight. Uh, just so you'll know, you will uh, have an opportunity to have this uh, presentation uh, at your disposal. And we will send you more information about that. So again, I want to thank every, everyone for coming out tonight. And everyone have a great evening. Uh, thanks again.